perfect well welcome yeah. S- stefan stefan how how do you like how how do you go with it? what's your name uh Ste- yeah stefan's fine stefan yeah. okay well welcome stefan to flora funga podcast i i think i heard you on um another podcast that I listened to and I was like oh my gosh I would love to interview him for cacti and also the whole plant and fungi interactions so that was um kind of how we started off but I would love you to introduce yourself and kind of how you got into flora and fungi in general yeah awesome so I'm Australian if you can't already tell by my (laughs) accent and I've lived in Chile for well, I first came to Chile around five years ago, mm-hmm. um, and I've lived in the country, yeah, for almost four years, actually. Wow. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, basically, I mean, I got into cacti and plants in general from a pretty young age, just from a cultivation standpoint, not necessarily from a research standpoint, mm-hmm. because um, my, my grandparents had a really large landscape garden, and so my grandmother was yeah, a real um, plant nut, you know, they just grew everything. I mean, my grandfather was a, an agricultural farmer, um, but my grandfather actually had a small cactus garden. And oh, so cool. that, that really caught my, yeah, that caught my attention from a pretty young age, like probably about nine or 10 years old. And so I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and they caught on to my interest and mm-hmm. Actually, one of my uncles bought me a cactus encyclopedia, and I still remember looking through that and trying to identify the cacti in my grandfather's garden, and and that actually led to you know reading about the plants and saying, oh, this one comes. Oh, it it uh, glitched out for some reason. Oh, did that? Yeah, that just totally cut out, right? Yes, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm like I'm on. I've switched back to my mobile data because I guess the Wi-Fi can be sort of dodgy. Okay. Um, yeah. So where was where did you hear up to? Uh, where you got the encyclopedia of the cacti from your grandparents yeah all right so i'll start from there again um yeah so what actually happened was my uncle or one of my uncles bought me uh, a cactus encyclopedia and so that led to me identifying the plants and reading more about them and saying oh you know this one comes from argentina this mm-hmm. one comes from mexico and then that led to getting out the atlas and actually looking you know, the geography of the countries and, and where they grew. So I remember that really sparked my interest from a young age. And and then my mum actually joined me up with a local cactus and succulent mm. society in my in my region in Australia. So oh, that's cool. we used to go there for, yeah, that was awesome. We used to go there for like monthly meetings. And uh, some of the members had actually made trips to, uh, Chile and Mexico and other countries overseas so oh, it was wow. really inspiring yeah it was super inspiring to hear about their expeditions and all of that and so from a young age I was really interested in doing that but you know I didn't really sort of pursue it at the level that I'm pursuing it now until I was like I don't know 27 I guess because okay. through school I mean your interests kind of you know, can sway and change and um you know ended up working in engineering and going to university after that and doing all kinds of different stuff but then um yeah sort of in my later 20s my my interest in cacti and succulents really ignited again and um it felt like the time to go and see them in habitat and so that's kind of led me to the point where I'm at now um yeah in a nutshell (laughs) yeah so you kind of got into cacti and then kind of wanted to see like where they live in different areas correct yeah yeah that fascinated me I mean I I've always been into travel Mm -hmm. like I traveled to a bunch of other countries um before Chile but you know uh, as I got a little bit older 
the motivation for travel and more about seeing plants and habitat rather than going to you know a touristy mm-hmm. kind of destination um and it's it's led into you know a pretty good session i guess because i just realized there was so much that i didn't know mm-hmm. about their e- ecology i mean there's obviously you know uh, a lot of people have a plant in the collection at home and that's really sort of the extent of it but they're a piece of evolutionary history and mm. they fit into a big ecological puzzle and the more that I started diving into that the more interested I become became mm. in the evolution and how they function and you know the other um, associations they have with other life and so that has been a really interesting journey yeah yeah, so like um, what have you learned that cacti play an important role in the ecosystem and with other plants and animals? Yeah, so um, I mean, obviously a lot of them have got fairly specific pollinators and pollination mm-hmm. syndromes. And so, well, I'm going to use Chile as my example because it's the country that I know best. And so on the edge of the Atacama Desert here, we've got these really niche habitats in these fog oases. And so pollinators in the area, uh, hoverflies, for example, yeah, the, are the biggest ones of cacti here, um, as well as native bees too. But the hoverflies are really interesting because they pollinate the cacti and they also uh, lay their larva in the rotten tissue of cacti when they die. So oh. essentially, the complete life cycle of hoverflies here in Chile revolves uh, around cacti, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, the, in, the, in, in their life and death. So that's been really fascinating. So I remember, like, you know, on the ground, and actually stuff because the level of curiosity is pretty high. And so inside of that rotten tissue, it was just full of fly lava. And oh I was like, God. wow, that's, um, that's really... It's really interesting. Well, at the time, I didn't realize they were lava from those fires because, you know, moths actually put the, their lava in, um, in rotten tea too. Um, but, yeah, that was, that was a really sort of fascinating connection. Um, but uh, also, you know, seeing a cactus in habitat here, it's such a brutal environment, and they're, they're off going in pure rock so mm-hmm. pure granite or rhyolite or some other volcanic rock and seeing a cactus growing out of like a rocky you know or just a, a crack in a pure rock was just like yeah. what how, how is it doing that you know how could it <laughs> yeah, actually that's true. do that and i mean rocky crevices are actually a great place for water to um to accumulate you know it condensates on the rock and trickles down into the rocky crevice yeah. because yeah, we're talking about environments that are really hard. And so, um, or even growing at the base of a rock, you know, have roots underneath the rock. It, it maintains humidity for the more open, exposed ground. But, you know, I started diving into the question a bit more of like how they're actually getting that nutrition. Mm-hmm. And that's where the, the fungal or the microbial aspects come into it uh, yes. with bacteria, like bacteria, archaea, but, but, also uh, mycorrhizal fungi or fungi um i'm going to say fungi because i don't know that's how we pronounce it in australia yeah no everybody says it different i love it <laughs> we all know what it is yeah <laughs> yeah so um i mean i don't really knew much about mycorrhizal networks you know i mean i sort of knew that they did in forests mm-hmm. you know they call it like like the wood white web or whatever and so you've got yep, yep. you know all this uh, underground communication going on but i never really associated it with like um desert biomes mm-hmm. and the more that i looked into it like cacti are actually highly mycorrhizal and also a lot of other desert plants too um so basically you know i mean the mycorrhizae are excreting uh, enzymes and that's helping to dissolve rock and break down kind of like phosphorus and potassium and make that available to plants and cacti, um, which is super awesome, super intriguing because, you know, you know imagine you've got this like rocky crab with the cactus root right mm-hmm. down in there, but then it reaches a point where the cactus root can't really enter into the rock anymore, but you've got these, you know, mm-hmm. microscopic like, um, filaments on the fungi that are kind of like exploring those little okay. edge pits and 
and little micro crevices in the rock and that's like then they're dissolving them and kind of drilling mm. them deeper into the rock and breaking that rock apart i mean and i mean that's mm. like what lichen does and um you know other kinds of, of microbes in the desert too mm. but that connection was really sort of mind-blowing for me you know and mm -hmm and really understanding about what a true symbiosis is, you know? Um, yeah. So, so you've got like this chemical weathering process, the bacteria and the fungi are doing, and that's, um, you know, making nutrients available mm -hmm. to the cactus and the cactus is providing those microbes with sugars and carbon and probably water too. Um, but yeah, the, the the mycorrhizal fungi are actually expanding the the area, like the absorption area of the cactus roots too, mm -hmm. and that right. surface area. Yeah, 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 for water, and so that's like obviously super important in yeah. deserts too. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, those like tiny little microscopic films are kind of in this like labyrinth of rural helping to collect more water and nutrients, you know, sort of expanding that root network out even further. And mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so that makes a lot of sense in a desert um, biome as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think that it's like the same ratio as like cacti and fungi um, relationships compared to like the wood wide web? Um, or do you think cacti need more because they have lack of nutrients? That's a good question. I think they I think they have a lot. I mm -hmm. think, you know, that they're super mycorrhizal plants, maybe even more than some mm -hmm. than trees, for example. Um, but you know, there's not a research that's gone into it. Like if you actually look into it into the in academia, there's there's very few papers in the literature okay. about the stuff. You know? Interesting. Um, yeah very little research has gone into it you know less in in chile or in south america i think yeah. there's a few papers that have gone into it in mexico and perhaps canada but like mm -hmm. literally only a handful specifically about like the mycorrhizal fungi fungi there's a few more papers out there about like um bacteria okay living in like in the rhizosphere of, of cactus roots or the endophytic bacteria and in, in the roots mm -hmm. um but still, it's in the pretty early days, and there's a lot that okay. we don't know. Well, now I know what I can focus on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, but it's super interesting, and I'm I'm following it, you know, reasonably closely. Um, I mean, in my spare time, like I'm I'm in the I'm in the field a lot. I spend a lot of time in the field. You know, yeah, you know, and any, any free time I do get, I go into to researching this stuff a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah i'm still on my journey of learning a lot about the whole process too but um yeah the the microorganism aspect is truly fascinating i mean we talked a little bit about the micro uh, mycorrhizal fungi but the bacteria and archaea have a pretty major mm -hmm. role to play yeah, too it's it's especially in, yeah yeah and like nitrogen fixation from the atmosphere and stuff like that a mm -hmm. lot of plants you know are using um or are working with i should say um the bacteria and archaea to do that nitrogen fixation mm -hmm. um and it's even more important in really um you know nutrient poor soils so like in desert biomes and stuff like that so yeah like the lack of water you'll have to somehow ex extract something out of these rocks or <laughs> somewhere yeah. The that's interesting lack of, but also the lack of, of nutrients i mean in a forest or in a jungle you've got a lot of organic matter mm. that you know you've got that form organic soils but i can tell you that some of the cacti are not growing in anything organic they're growing in literally pure um you know that rock or rhyolite rock or any mm. kind of volcanic rock wow. um, along the coast here in chile i mean you've got some really interesting niche but that's in mexico where cacti growing gypsum and limestone mm, mm -hmm. um in, in other countries too of course it happens but um you know just seeing the really extreme habitats that they're able to colonize 
you know, thanks to their associations with these microorganisms mm -hmm. is really, really fascinating. Yeah. No, that thank you for the fungal associates that are helping out for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure that they, they, they wouldn't be able to do it or they wouldn't be able to do it as well as they're doing it mm -hmm. without, you know, without yeah. those associations or they wouldn't be able to colonize the, you know, the same amount of different habitats. Yeah, that's um, true. Um, so yeah. why why did you pick Chile to um, live live in live at? So, in terms of Latin America, Chile is one of the most stable and safest countries to okay. live in. Um, and it really interested me to go out and explore sort of more underexplored places. Mm. And South America was always you know, really high on my list. You know, I remember just being fascinated by it as a kid. It was just kind of seemed so adventurous, you know. Mm -hmm. And and I really loved that sort of that aspect of it, kind of to explore a place that was so different to my own, own culture and my different right. to my own, you know, natural surroundings back in Australia. Um, but also the cacti of Chile is super interesting. Like the ecology here on the edge of the Atacama Desert is is highly highly interesting mm. and it's absolutely one of if not the most extreme place in terms of aridity where where cacti grow and so that's kind of led me to really dive down deep into you know how they can actually do what they do here right yeah. okay and, um so if you go over to for example argentina or uruguay or brazil you're entering areas which get a lot higher rainfall and there's a lot more organic content oh, around. Okay. Yeah, and the soils. And so, like, the cacti, you know, really respond to that. They've evolved and adapted to that. And even mm -hmm. in cultivation, you can notice, you know, if you've got a cactus from Uruguay, for example, they really need more organic-type content. They sort of go chlorotic and, you know, this really ugly lime green colour. They just look really starved mm. and unhealthy in cultivation don't give them a lot of more organic type soil whereas the opposite's true for the chilean cacti they really thrive oh, okay really kind of yeah. inorganic sort of like decomposing granite or really old you know crushed scoria rhyolite mm. rock volcanic rock they really thrive in those kind of soils you know you can just tell by the appearance of the plant whether it's happy or not yeah and so you know that understanding of where they come from in the tat and what the the substrate is that they're adapted to is you know yeah. very true as to how you should care for it or what you should provide it with in in cultivation mm, yeah it seems like they're very adapted to where they are so they're kind of just happy where they're living because they've been there for i guess so many <laughs> years <laughs> that's awesome. yeah yeah hmm. yeah do you find that you see similar connections with like a, the same plant species and the same fungi species throughout, or do they act like other plants where they have multiple different like associations? That makes um, sense. Yeah, it does. There's, like I said, there's very little research into like okay. the, the exact types of mycorrhiza, but I know that, um, a buscular mycorrhiza so that mm -hmm. sort of branch out kind of ramify like a tree branch are pretty common and it makes a lot of sense um especially in cacti so like if you think down below ground level if you've got you know the root network and then you've got this uh, buscular type mycorrhiza which can span out maybe even i don't know six or eight inches more uh, wow, you know, yeah um below ground level or amplifying that root network you know mm -hmm. um that's that's going to help collect more water and nutrients so it makes sense for cacti to have an association with those types of oh, okay mycorrhizal so, right so we kind of understand like the types but not like the species yeah for okay. species level there's there's very little information out there about it. there's one paper which does list species um mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I couldn't recite them off right. the top of my head. No. I need to go That's and look awesome. At the so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I'm I'm looking to move to Arizona, um, hopefully this coming year. So maybe there's research where 
they need. So that's that's somewhere that I can um, help it. So going to look Definitely. into that. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, I highly recommend it because there's very little, re- it's a very sort of, um, yeah, new area of study. So yeah. Definitely, because people just look outside and they're like, oh, it's just rocks. And it's like, no, there's actually plants there. (laughs) If you see, if you look. (laughs) Oh, I mean, you know, uh, yeah, the desert for me is just fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I I, I go around now looking at like even um, these cryptobiotic crusts with cyanobacteria and and you've got these like um, grit crusts, they call them now, which form here in the Atacama Desert. So you've got... These tiny little lichens sort of uh, growing in this grit, you know, kind of like mm-hmm. decomposed pulverized granite. Uh, so really, really high in silica content. And, and you've just got this carb. You can see the soil change mm. as you look in the desert. And if you hit it from the right angle, you can see it sort of get darker or, or lighter. And so you go to the darker patches and you go down with your little lens and you can mm-hmm. see little lichens oh, growing so in there. cute yeah yeah and that's just fascinating you know and, and from like a biodiversity aspect I think it's really important that that people understand that there is abundant life even in somewhere that looks like it's lifeless yes um for conservation perspectives and preserving biodiversity so and I mean that even comes down to the point of like looking at a cactus you know, people just say oh it's you know that's just a cactus but you go over to it and you've got like up to like I don't know even 12 or 15 different lichen species growing on the cactus especially in fog zones um like along the coast here in chile so and then when you think about what is inside the cactus i mean in the different compartments you've got different bacteria yeah. and archaea and then in the root network we're talking about mycorrhizal uh mycorrhizal associations bacterial mm-hmm. associations so you could then look at a cactus and say well actually on that one plant we could have up to, you know, even 30, 30 plus different forms of life here mm-hmm. in this one kind of biome and this one little network on this one plant, you know. So it's yeah. not just one species that we're talking about. We're talking, you know, I don't know, that's just an arbitrary number yeah. that I, I, I grabbed out of nowhere. But I've looked at the studies and there's, there's quite a lot, there's probably many, many more actually. We could even be talking in hundreds of different species in the one plant when you look break down the different bacteria species and archaea species and all of that mm-hmm. um but it's such a complex network you know and yes. and from a biodiversity perspective it's like i think that's that's how people need to be thinking about it more yeah i am all about the biodiversity i love that and yeah i guess living in the harsh conditions you kind of all have to work together <laughs> um yeah <so> that- <laughs> Yeah, you can really see out. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can really see it here. Like that's that's what I love about this kind of extreme environment is you can you can see the you know how they depend on one another all yeah. the different life forms at that extreme level. It might not be so obvious in like a forest where it's just it's happening obviously, but at an right. overwhelming kind of level. That's but here true. it's sort of a bit more simplified. You can see it a little bit more more mm. clearly, I think. Um, yeah. which is what I like about being here and studying that stuff here Mm. like that um can you give like the listeners like a rundown of how the anatomy is of a cactus and how it's might maybe different than a plant so do all cacti kind of have a certain roots or does it kind of have um Mm. certain like petals or like the spikes or stuff like that yeah look i mean cacti and uh themselves are really diverse Mm -hmm. family of plants uh, I mean, we've got over 2,000 different species and there's all different forms. I mean, you can have a columnar cactus. Um, so, you know, you can think of like a saguaro cactus, Carnegie Gigantea in Arizona, you know, it's really big columnar cactus, but you've also got barrel cacti, which are sort of shorter, stouter, fatter. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in Chile here, it's famous for geophytic cacti, which fit into the same class as bulbs or or rhizomes so you've actually got this tiny little cactus which um actually even shrinks below ground level oh. and it's got a, a really big nappy form or um taproot okay kind of like a carrot you know and mm-hmm. so so uh, a lot of cacti do have taproots to help store 
water and nutrients below ground. But then, you know, a big cactus like the Carnegie Gigantea, Saguaro, it's got a fascicular root system. So many, you know, a very big uh, web of network of roots, which, which mm -hmm. helps support it. Um, so, and then you've also got epiphytic cacti, which grow in um, uh, uh, forests, but also in jungles. So in the Amazon jungle, there's a lot of epiphytic cacti, which grow in the tree canopy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so mm -hmm. that's a whole different, you know, anatomy again. And, well, of course, they're also using a lot of um, bacteria and microbial things up there to, to survive in the top of the tree canopy too, where it's also mm -hmm. quite arid. So, you know, they've, they've colonized arid style habitats in all kinds of different areas. Um, and then, of course, you've got the Apuntia cactus, which is, you know, it's got like a paddle, you know, um, and they're a very common cactus, uh, you know, in agriculture and in people's gardens too, yeah. or prickly, prickly pear, as they call yep. them in Australia. Or yep, that's what the they call it there. here too. Okay, so yeah. that's what the paddle is, and then they kind of grow off of each other's paddle yeah create their yeah. own and, okay and so all cacti have got um these these structures on them called areoles or areola and so they're kind of like those little circular points that you see on the rib of a cactus okay yep and so from each of those points is where you get uh, the spines coming out of glockids trichomes flowers fruits you know everything you know Mm -hmm. uh, re reproductive about the cactus and and defensively too mostly uh, occurs from that aerial and so they are generated from the the crown or the apices of the cactus so as it grows it's producing more aerials and each aerial can only flower once in its lifetime so oh, okay yeah so okay. if the cactus isn't growing and producing new aerials it's mm -hmm. not going to flower or produce fruits so um in chile here on drought years sometimes the cacti don't grow at all and there's very mm -hmm. little flowers um mm. got it okay awesome yeah that's a yeah. i i forget how vast it is but it is very diverse as well and yeah yeah, yeah that's cool oh hmm. I and mean, of course cacti don't have well mo uh, most cacti don't have leaves there are some which still do have leaves but oh, really um, the photos yeah, the photosynthesis um, occurs in the stem or the vortex of the cactus. So, you know, that's why a lot of cacti are, are green. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And what <laughs> yeah. is the what's the photosynthesis thing that they use again? Is it the cam or yeah, cam photosynthesis? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So they do the gas they do the gas exchange in the night time when it's cooler, so they lose less water. Mm -hmm. um, is essentially the, the, the main idea behind that mm. awesome I like that um and let's see what other types of like opportunities have you gotten with what you're doing currently and what are you currently kind of working on are you in research are you doing your own thing are you kind of in school um traveling all the yeah, so <laughs> yes kind of like a mix of all of that um but basically I'm doing independent research. So um, specifically about the cacti in Chile. So I do online presentations, I, I'm writing some articles okay. and I'm working on some um, other publications too. And well, tourism is, is a big part of what I do. So I work in ecotourism here um, okay. in Chile and that's my main way that I sort of generate income and what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, uh, with locals, but also with foreigners who want to come over and check out habitat related to cats and all kinds of other different uh, expeditions. Um, but the tourism thing wasn't actually a plan. That sort of um, just eventuated out of networking, basically, and getting more exposure on um, social media and more exposure to different botanical groups and societies and mm -hmm. things like that. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah. And why is conservation with cacti important? <sighs> yeah, um, <laughs> the conservation thing is a really, you know, it's something that I'm 
also working a lot. In, I'm working in conservation too, mm-hmm. uh, developing infographics and you know trying to educate people about the important role that cacti play in the habitats. Um, I mean, we talked a lot about that with their pollinators. I mean, a lot of um, pollinators here they don't have maybe a hundred percent you know mutualistic type relationship with the cacti. They've got they pollinate other things too, but. Uh, mm-hmm. Cacti just make up such a large portion of plants which inhabit and have colonized arid um, zones across all of the Americas, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they're really keystone species in uh, a desert biome. Yeah, the Cactaceae family. I mean, there's plenty of other different families too, but the cactus family is just so large and diverse. I mean, you can mm-hmm. find it anywhere from Canada all the way, all the way down through the Caribbean, all the way down through South America, down to Patagonia. You know, yeah. so That's and they've colonized different niche habitats all over the place. Mm-hmm. You know, awesome. And so then, I guess, kind of going into like poaching and how that all works like what is the trouble with that and I think that's even happening near the states too with like peyote and people are trying to dig up that and then it's an endangered species now so how how can we help with that and what is like cactus poaching yeah (laughs) yeah so I mean in the beginning people like what poaching they they associate that word with Animal poaching mm-hmm. is, is really well known for, you know, anything from rhinos to tigers in Africa, um, um, even for shark, shark fin soup in Japan, you know. Yep. Um, and have been exploited, you know, in multiple dimensions for that. Or even lean in Madagascar or, or exotic parrots, you know, people want for pets. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, same thing happens with um, plants. So there's a few different angles from it. I mean, some of it's um, people are poaching for the horticultural trade. So they're wanting to sell plants to people who are collectors mm-hmm. um, or people who just want ornamental house plants, stuff like that. But then you've got the other aspect, which is drugs. So peyote, for example, is a, is a um, schedule one drug, in the United States. Mm-hmm. And um, amongst other cacti too, like Trichosirius or Echinopsis, um, Pachinoi, but you've got various different cacti which are um, have psychoactive properties. They've got mescaline and other other stuff in them. So people are exploiting them for that reason too. Um, so I mean, with peyote, you know, it used to be fairly common in southern areas of the United States, but now it's pretty much extinct. Um, yeah, due to to over collection for for de- various different reasons, you know. Um, mm-hmm. any of the, the the main two that I've discussed there um, it's such a slow growing thing so it's hard to like pick yeah. it all and then how do you even yeah how do you even like let stuff grow or how do you even um, help it get back to existing <laughs> yeah yeah I mean like there's some you know natural seed banks left in the soil but you know, oftentimes when people have gone through and sort of obliterated a subpopulation of sort of, sometimes they even destroy the niche habitat in which, which these plants grow in, you know, oh, wow. and for them to kind of recolonize that area is difficult, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a very overwhelming issue, to be honest. Um, yeah. I mean, habitats being affected by poaching obviously but also the expansion of civilization climate change there's multiple different dimensions you know to the conservation aspect but for poaching specifically i mean in south america it's it's rife i mean here in chile you know copiapoa cacti erosize the two genres which have been really exploited for the horticultural trade specifically they don't have psychoactive properties but um they're highly uh, ornamental plants and they're very mm. slow growing and the risk that they produce in habitat here and in other countries too like in mexico other other you know areo carp different genre the characteristics of what people go for you know um mm. because they're just more on on and on it's difficult to replicate that in, in cultivation um you know 100 year old copia from chile you know it's never going to look like it's never going to look the same. Even a hundred-year-old copy of that's been grown in cultivation. Yeah, you know, that's true. Overseas, 
is not going to look the same. Mm. Um, it just doesn't have those characteristics, you know. And so that's that's what's being sold. Yeah. Wow. That yeah, ornamental that value. Mm. Hmm. Well, I'm glad that there's also, you said some seed banks, like are people collecting and storing and trying to do something or? Yeah. Um, so or there's is it kind really of big... no hope? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, reintroduction back into habitat is very difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. one, habitat needs to still be intact. Two, there needs to be enough seeds which is a lot usually mm -hmm. and i mean for a healthy population you really need um plenty different ages you know and what we know about mycorrhizal associations too if you've got a seedling growing near to a parent plant you know those mycorrhizal associations they help each other out the parent mm -hmm. plant can help to transfer nutrients and water to seedlings and stuff like that through their my mycorrhizal associations and so if you don't have adult plants if a seedling germinates, you know, it might not have, it's not going to have as high a success rate yeah. as if it was growing in a healthy population of plants of all different ages, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, but like to specifically answer your question, I mean, there are people doing seed banking projects, you know, um, in the States, but also in the, in the UK, um, the Q Botanical Gardens is running the Millennium Seed Bank. Okay. project and that's that's massive that's huge they've got you know i think billions of seeds in their seed bank over there um in england but um they've also developed seed banking um points globally too in south africa and also here in chile too there's the mm -hmm. seed bank um which they they funded the majority of to get it established and it's running quite well i've visited it once and i'm due to visit again awesome. um they've got a large diversity of seeds in there anything from agricultural seeds to, to endemic plants uh, from chile so they're doing a really great job at that Good. um and they're cultivating some highly endangered plants here mm -hmm. um at the site there too yeah yeah, that would be interesting collecting cacti seeds. Like, are they really small? And how, what is the journey of that? Like, you just get <laughs> on your hands and knees and look for things, or you take like an actual uh, root? Yeah, okay. And then you just go from there. Okay. Yeah. So they all produce fruit. Um, you know, some fruits are larger than others here mm -hmm. in Chile. Generally speaking, they're quite small, though it depends on the species. Some of the the taller, more arborescent column, the cacti have larger fruits. But, um, you know, it, it, it can be a bit difficult, especially for the larger fruited ones, because there's a lot of pulp and a lot of, you know, mm. other tissue in there. So they've got to be dried out and the seeds have to be separated and it can be quite a tedious okay. sort, of, sort of process. But the smaller cacti, the smaller fruits, there's not a lot of pulp in the, in the fruit. And so the seeds... If it's if it's dried out and then fall out, and it's quite easily to collect them. Oh, okay, that makes um, sense. Hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I also saw something on your Instagram about avocado wars, and I had to ask <laughs> what that is. Oh yeah, the avocado wars thing. So I mean, it sounds so crazy. I mean, you look, you, you know, you, you go into the supermarket and you, you have a, a tray of avocados there on the shelf and you look at it, you think, what an innocent thing, an <laughs> avocado, fruit. you know, right? It's an avocado. Right. It's just an avocado. <laughs> it's an avocado. But what's happening, mm -hmm. um, and especially in Mexico, but also in South America and countries like Peru as well, I mean, avocados are expensive. Yes. And, and they call them the, they call them the green gold. And I mean, how much is it a kilo for avocado? It depends on where you live. But what's happening is that growers um, are actually being um, what's the right word for it? Well, what's happening is the cartel is coming in, mm -hmm. and they are essentially robbing the avocados from the plantations, um, and they're also um, manipulating the the orchard growers into you know you know back backroom deals and stuff like mm -hmm. that selling off the avocados and things like that um but i mean you know it, it gets brutal i mean people have been killed over it yeah. entire orchards have been hijacked with you know the owners literally shot dead and the wow. cartel yeah. running the avocado <laughs> orchard um so you know it just sounds so crazy but you know there's big money involved in it and um 
that's basically what's what's happening and it's difficult difficult to control yeah especially throughout latin america and so i mean avocados have really boomed in western countries you know united states australia um new zealand england mm-hmm. you know and so that demand has um has increased and so the avocado is not always coming from people who have what's the right word to use i mean you know they're they're not coming from the growers themselves yeah always they're literally coming from drug cartel yeah (laughs) that's crazy yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. the more that people know i mean you know if you really want that avocado then (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it happens with avocados it happens with uh, vineyards with grapes for wine mm-hmm. all kinds of like stuff. chocolate maybe yeah chocolate okay. coffee yep, as well coffee. yeah um all those kind of products you know um and so <laughs> it is wild you know and it happens so much here in south america where things are sort of less regulated and i mean mm-hmm. it's a lot more corruption um you know even in up to like governmental hierarchies and oh, you yeah. know police and all that kind of thing so everyone's kind of getting paid off and it's just happening and so it's unfortunate because the people who are doing the hard work yes to establish the orchards and to you know imagine how much work it yeah. takes to do that they're doing all the hard yards and someone else is coming in and taking all of the benefits yep um and that's basically this you know the avocado was there's a, there's a mini documentary on it on netflix about it mm-hmm. yeah yeah that is crazy um and then I guess going back to the cacti what is something that you want everybody to know about cactus like a cactus like is there one cacti fact that you really like or um, something that people don't know (laughs) so I think the thing that people get confused about um and -hmm. something that someone told me from a very young age is every cactus is a succulent Mm. but not every succulent is a cactus yes okay so um i think a lot of people didn't make the connection that the cacti were succulents um and a lot of some people don't like that they don't like to think that the cactus they they associate a succulent as something a bit more delicate you know without spines or with cactuses sort of more viewed more of as kind of like a you know i don't know a macho kind of plant you know Mm -hmm. defensive signs and, and all of that kind of thing but but it's interesting to think about it that way um you know they all have some succulent tissue and they're all adapted to some kind of uh environment usually that um that has some kind of drought phase got mm. it i like that one because yeah it makes sense and yeah easy and simple <laughs> yeah um, so i have some uh some questions from instagram that I want to ask you. One is, <laughs> okay. um, what cactus would you like to pet if it wasn't so angry? So that goes with like the spines and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so there's a cactus that they call the the teddy bear cactus or oh. Huntia. Oh, well, there's the teddy bear choya from, um, you know, from, from Arizona and, and also Northern Mexico too, but I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about this other one that's Apontia micro, micro disis or micro daisies. Okay. And it, it doesn't actually have like long spines. It's got tiny little glockets, mm. you know, so out of each of the, the areole, it's got these tiny little glockets and it looks really soft. Mm-hmm. It looks okay. really, really, really soft from a distance. And I've seen people do this in, in my collection in Australia. They go up and touch it. Oh no. And, really, and the glockets, you know, they're, they're almost worse than a spine in a yeah, way. Because you can't they, get them off as easy and they're so small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, they're just horrible little things. And then they can stick to your clothes and then oh, they can, no. you know, they, they can be there days later still, oh, still kind gosh. of haunting you. Um, but yeah, it just, they just look so soft, you know. Yes. Um, um, and yeah, they're just not. <laughs> yeah, they're not. Okay. I like it's that one. It's a total deception. It's a total deception. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then how do you feel about people growing cacti at home? That's from uh, MN Prairie Gal. Yeah, so I think it's great. You know, mm-hmm. um, I think it's fantastic that people grow cacti at home. I mean, I've got a huge 
cactus garden back in Australia. I, I don't grow many here because I'm more focused on, you know, uh, mm. spending time in the field. But but absolutely, like, I mean, I've, I've loved growing cacti um, over my years uh, collecting and stuff like that. But I think, obviously, the, the main thing that, um, that I, I want people to be aware, aware of is the, the ethical side of it, you know, right. whether that cactus has been um, grown from a, a cutting, you know, from, from a friend or, or, you know, whether it's been grown from seed or, mm-hmm. and also where nurseries are, are, are um, obtaining their plants from too, you know. That's true. Do you um, yeah, you know, has oh, yeah, that's been dug up from habitat, that kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, it's it's not ethical or legal, in fact, to, to go out into habitat and dig a cactus up from from the wild and then grow it at home. You know, they should always be um, cultivated ethically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what are some like growing tips or watering tips? Because I think people either forget about their cacti or they overlove it and then they water it too much. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's probably it's two both extremes, isn't it? That spectrum. Mm. But, but basically they need to dry out between waterings. And um, I've heard people say a lot, oh, you know, cacti don't like water or they even heard people say, oh, cacti hate water. And that's just <laughs> not true. It's completely untrue. They love water, mm-hmm. but you know, they, they don't like to, they, they need to dry out between waterings i think is the is the key step and okay. and don't keep your pot with a little tray of water underneath it right <laughs> you they, know, don't like their feet wet. Who, they don't want their feet wet you know um, they need good drainage and you know for the most part you know just put lots of really crushed uh you know scoria in the mix or, or decomposed granite if you can get your hands on it but um mm-hmm. you know have a nice mix there lots of you know lots of stones in the soil to, to allow good drainage okay mm-hmm. awesome um and then one more esprote says uh do you have succulents at home which i think um <laughs> what is your home technically are you <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's probably the, that's a good question um well i, I do have like um in a house in Australia, but I'm obviously not living there at the moment. It's rented. Um, but there I've got a, a cactus and succulent garden, which mm. pretty much just looks after itself. So I've yeah. just chosen species which uh, are tolerant to the climate and just let them do their thing, essentially. Oh, yeah. um, but here in Chile, I don't cultivate. Um, well, I literally live in a small apartment. And, well, I've got um, you know a couple of plants just mm. on the balcony in pots. Um, but you know just for the maintenance side of things i i don't i don't take cultivating seriously here in chile because right. making the most of um you know exploring and getting out there in the habitat i love taking photos i'm really big into photography and yes. um i mean i've been i go for long stretches i mean I've, you've caught me currently on on a trip now you know and mm. um i mean i'm in a little hot at the moment but i but i often camp or even sleep in the car put the seats down whatever it takes you know and mm-hmm. i've gone sometimes for months on end um wow. <laughs> yeah just really stretching it out mm-hmm. um but um just make the most opportunity here so more exploring and cultivating yeah mm-hmm. i guess my next question was what is like a typical day look like for you um but it seems like you're out Depends. and about a lot and yeah um, um i sort of go in phase right now it's been it's there's been some rains so i'm making the most of being out in habitat here as much as i can mm, okay. um, but you know in the in the in the winter or in the autumn you know when it's kind of there's not much happening in habitat i do other things i focus more on well i even do english lands in the city where i live in in antofagasta you know so i help mm-hmm. out an english school there and i have um private clients and we do some stuff on as well so um you know it kind of depends on the time of year where i'm focusing more of my attention um and when i'm in my downtime too i try and do more online presentation stuff like that yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, and I found you on Instagram. Can you say what your handle is or other like presentations um, or if you have a website or anything where people can find that? Yeah. Yeah, so if you look up Mm cactusexplorer.com down the bottom of the page, I've got direct links to all of my social media um, stuff. Yeah, I've got Instagram, uh, Facebook. I've got 
Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm pretty sure all of them are just at Cactus Explorer. Okay. Um, Instagram has got an underscore after the Cactus Explorer. If you just look mm-hmm. up Cactus Explorer on any of those, you should find me pretty easily. Yeah. Um, I've even got I've even got TikTok yeah oh, yes. <laughs> yes i'll have to link all of these below in our in the show notes that would be fun <laughs> awesome. yeah. yeah and a couple questions that i ask everyone um would you do you have advice for your younger self if you could go back hmm. um i would just say you know if, for anyone who's interested in their, their passion mm-hmm. you know start studying it more when when you're younger you know um yeah. and if you if you are passionate about something that I, I used to write my passion as like just a hobby you know not something that right. I was sure at a, at a career level you know mm-hmm. um but that that is just so not true I would just say the complete opposite for someone you know who's passionate about whatever it is um pursue it at a career level go for it you know study it academically mm-hmm. you know really get in involved as, as early on as you can because um there's a lot of information out there and it takes time to absorb it all and and keep taking the next step to progress so yeah no it's that yeah. is some good advice um, soon enough. Yeah. um and how can flora and funga uh, as a whole like influence the future in your eyes oh gee well i mean end on it don't we i mean everything that we do as humans pinned by flora and fungi and microbial system whether we whether we understand it or or like to think about it like that or not um Mm -hmm. so i think going forward conservation is is you know huge major we you know it's everything we depend on that um but i think also it's interesting to see how um, the agricultural world is working with mycorrhiza as well um, you know inoculating certain plants with with different kinds of mycorrhiza so that they can grow them in more extreme kind of climates and stuff like that which is going to be more important as we sort of start to get more de- uh, desertification happening in places as well so yeah definitely. there's kind of advancements with agriculture agricultural technologies um, you know related to plants and fungi i think is is interesting and something that people you know should be aware of yeah yeah i agree and i guess that kind of leaks into this next one where it's uh how can people get more involved with flora and fungi and i think conservation is a big part um yeah so i yeah, agree uh, absolutely i mean you know like Gee, uh, in Chile, for example, I mean, the Atacama Desert gets written off as a place which is, you know, sort of void of life, but mm. it's a reservoir for so much microbial life, you know, and stuff that's still being discovered. Um, archaeal communities and bacteria communities, and, you know, stuff that's brand new to science is being discovered and stuff that they're even using in cancer research and all those kind of things. Wow. I mean, I don't always like that stuff's being ex- essentially exploited for the benefit of humanity. I think it should yeah. be preserved just because it exists and it's yes. awesome. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it, it sort of always annoys me, I must admit, when I read a study and at the end of it, there's always something about its economical purpose or commercial purpose or how mm-hmm. it's going to somehow serve humanity and that. And that just annoys the crap out of me because I'm like, <laughs> why can't it just be appreciated with the awesomeness that it is? Agreed, like, you know? agreed. I love like, that. Like, why does it always have to be linked back to how we can somehow exploit it or how it can Yep, be how does it help it? humans? It's like, yeah. it can just be its own thing and we should just love it for what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like, you know, um, but that's my, that's my rant on that. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I love that. Um, yeah. And do you have any resources um, that you enjoyed reading or anything do you want to share to the listeners if they want to get into cacti or conservation or um, anything like that? Oh, gee, I mean, I could link you some some books and articles yeah. and some PDFs and stuff, but um, there's a really fantastic book by Jim Mouseth and a couple of other authors about um, his expeditions in uh, Bolivia, Argentina, and Peru. And that, that book was a really a real cornerstone of my learning about habitat mm. especially his uh, his 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 retired um um botanist 
um, but but he's he's done some really fantastic work. You know, he's written some great books, written book about botany, um, written a ton of articles, heaps of articles, a lot of stuff related to cacti and their ecology and habitat too. Mm, um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Stefan, for being on Flora Funga Podcast. I'm actually super intrigued to look into more of this cacti and microbe research because I'm like trying to figure out what I want to do with my master's and like going back for like plant physiology and conservation. So that's kind of where I'm like, ooh, what can I uh, make my mark on? So I think this would be really interesting to continue looking into. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. And I'm I'm really excited to see what you what you end up doing because yeah, it's an area which which I'm sure needs a lot more work. You it know. sounds like um, it. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Well, um, did you have anything else that I did not ask you or anything else you want to say to anybody? Um I think we've pretty much covered it for for the topics that we that we chatted about. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah if anyone wants to reach out at any any point in time they can contact me uh via any, any of my social media accounts or even via my website if i've got a question i've got a contact me page there perfect um, yeah i will definitely link link all of those so people will have just yeah. a click away to contact you sure awesome <laughs> but yeah thanks thanks so much for having me on the podcast it was it was fun yeah, yeah no thank you i love uh you have a lot to say so i really like that <laughs> i'm glad we figured could, everything out <laughs> i could i could talk a lot i could talk a lot about this stuff but yeah yes. i love it <laughs> i love the passion we need more people like yeah. you and you too i love you i like the podcast you know thank it's you great. Uh, it's a very niche style podcast and i think that in this day and age there's you know there's there's a niche thing a niche market for everything you know and, i agree and more people should be doing niche type stuff because that's how you know really specific ideas get exchanged and mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you very mm. much yeah well i You're hope welcome. you have a lovely week and yeah have a good day i don't even know what time it is there but it is morning here so yeah we're only like one hour apart oh no two hours apart i think okay. so it's it's wow. just ticking over to midday or 12 30 here so right. i've still got time to get out Perfect. and have a bit of a walk around in the in habitat <laughs> perfect well have a lovely day then thank you you too thank you see ya thanks bye